On January 8th in 1986, a short essay titled The Conscience of a Hacker was shared online. It was written shortly after the arrest of a hacker known as The Mentor in an attempt to define the hacker ethos. The end of the essay states the following. We seek after knowledge and you call us criminals. We exist without skin color, without nationality, without religious bias, and you call us criminals. Yes, I am a criminal. My My crime crime is that of curiosity. curiosity. You may stop me, but you can't stop us all. That's cool. All right, there's three different kinds. There's white hat, the good guys. There's gray hat, the good and bad guys. And then there's black hat, just the bad guys. They're comprised of coders, engineers, social engineers, activists, network specialists, scammers, crackers, and exploiters. Some of them work alone, some of them work in groups, and some of them even work for the government. I mean, until they don't. They're the outcasts, the antisocial nerds, the losers with computers. But they're also the ones who got rich off Bitcoin. The ones who throw a crazy party in Las Vegas every year. The ones who start billion dollar tech companies. The ones who steal millions of dollars from those tech companies. They're the ones who have changed the world. They are the hackers. But how did we even get here? Our story begins right at the start of what many now call the culture decade. In the early 1960s, a rebellious and transformative culture took root within the prestigious halls of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The beginning of hacker culture started on campus in Building 20, a structure which has since been deemed the magical incubator. Located on the third floor, you could find a crowded classroom that space was absolutely dominated by a carefully constructed layout of model train tracks. This space was the home to MIT's very own Tech Model Railroad Club. The club consisted of different groups that worked together towards their common goal of automating the operation of model trains. Some focused on crafting historical train replicas, others on scenery and buildings, but it was one group in particular, the Signals and Power Subcommittee, who were responsible for first popularizing the term hacker. This group was mainly responsible for creating the circuits that operated the trains. They were basically the engineers behind the whole operation. One member of the subcommittee was a guy named Peter Sampson. Now, it's important to understand that Peter was absolutely obsessed with electronics and automation, and he was always looking for new ways to be creative and pioneer new systems to operate model trains within the TMRC. He was also someone who loved to explore. One fateful night, around 2 o'clock in the morning, he roamed the basement hallways of Building 26 in search of something intriguing. Little did he know that this nocturnal exploration would lead him to a discovery, propelling him into a new realm of creativity, and even the beginning of a new lifestyle. Upon entering an area that was labeled the Electronic Accounting Machinery Room, Peter captured his first glimpse at an IBM 704 a multi-million dollar mainframe that took up almost the entirety of the space. Now, Peter was definitely not supposed to be here, as the room was usually heavily staffed during the day and only people with official security clearance from MIT were allowed to operate the computer in the first place. But no one was ever there at 2 a.m. Alongside other members of the TMRC, Peter would regularly sneak into the basement of Building 26 at night to use the computer and other devices held by the EAM room. These acts of defiance would mark the beginning of hacker culture as we now know it today. Machine time was extremely tight. Uh, They found times in the middle of the night, maybe in locked computer rooms where where they can do these things. The liberal arts majors whose only computer time available was if they gummed up the locks and snuck into the building late at night because they weren't allowed to sign up for this stuff. The people that took a systematic approach toward the development of uh, computer software missed the boat. It was the trial and error people working illegally in the underground who made most of the advances. In the following years, the TMRC would continue tinkering with computer technology, whether they had permission or not. But to be honest, using model trains as your excuse to be a hacker could really only get you so far. Subsequently, many TMRC members that were a part of the Signals and Power subcommittee went on to join MIT's Artificial Intelligence Lab. 
Led by the MIT lab director, Marvin Minsky, these early hackers had found a supportive mentor. Impressed by their determination, Minsky allowed them direct access to the machines. And with that, the lab members went to work. Among the many achievements of the MIT AI lab was the creation of Space War, one of the first video games, predating Pong by a decade. So those stars is part of a program Peter Sampson wrote called Expensive Planetarium. <laughs> With the success of visionaries at MIT and as the 1960s unfolded, the hacker ethos began to spread like wildfire, igniting centers of innovation at universities across the nation. From Carnegie Mellon to Stanford, the spirit of exploration thrived, fostering a new breed of technological pioneers. At this point, hacker culture seemed to be quite contained to the more academic circles, and it actually seemed like it was going to stay that way for a while. But it wasn't long until hacking spawned the comp sci student dropout cliche that we know all too well today. It all starts with the telephone. You know, Steve was never like you or me. He always saw things differently. Steve and I found this weird guy who was a hero around Berkeley all because he found a way to beat the system. This guy was called Captain Crunch because he figured out this little whistle that you found in boxes of Captain Crunch cereal had the same tones as AT&T's long distance equipment. So you got free phone calls anywhere in the world with, with, with this thing I built called the Blue Box. And then we tested it out by calling the Pope. You talked. <laughs> yeah, no, they're not putting you through the Pope, are they? There was a huge culture shift when John Draper, also known as Captain Crunch, helped pioneer the world of phone freaking. By blowing into that toy whistle, Draper and countless others fooled the phone companies and made free calls all around the world. When the two Steves began developing and distributing the aforementioned blue boxes, it actually marked one of the first times hacker culture garnered attention from the mainstream media, when Esquire magazine wrote about it in a 1971 article. Released in the same year, Freaking was also covered prominently in Abby Hoffman's now infamous publication, Steal This Book. Now, to be clear, Freaking wasn't just about making free calls, not to the hackers back then at least. Freaking was a new way to learn how the phone network worked, a way to pull some harmless pranks, a way to build a community within a growing subculture, and in some cases, a way to just simply stick it to the man. Honestly, it can be argued that Freaking turned out to be one of, if not the most influential aspects of hacker culture we've seen to date. With Steve Jobs even going as far to say that if it had not been for Wozniak's blue boxes, there wouldn't have been an Apple. This isn't the last time Freaking will come up in this video, as it definitely continued to evolve over the years. But for now, let's go back to the topic of computers. What's the mail this morning? This one looks interesting. Let's uh, take a look at this. I'm going to need a couple of copies of this. You'll have a television screen like each here and the keyboard, and he'll talk to the computer, get information from it, and he'll take it as much for granted as we take the telephone. I wonder though, what sort of a life would it be like in social terms? If our whole life is built around the computer, do we become a computer-dependent society? In some ways, but they'll also enrich our society, and this is a wonderful thing. As the 1970s progressed, so did the interconnectedness of computer networks. The rise of ARPANET provided a new frontier for exploration and experimentation. I'll try not to bore you, but for those unfamiliar, ARPANET was a computer network that helped lay the groundwork for the modern internet. It started out in the late 60s, mostly being used by research institutions and government agencies. Along the way, it helped define how file sharing works, and was even used to send and receive the first email. The network was pretty small initially, but as it grew, it quickly became a playground for hackers eager to push the boundaries of technology and communication. ARPANET also just happened to be the first computer network to get infected. In 1971, a computer scientist by the name of Bob Thomas created what is widely accepted as the first computer virus. Now known as the Creeper virus, this computer worm replicated itself and spread to other systems using ARPANET. It was developed by Bob while working at a technology research firm. And unlike most viruses, it wasn't made with any malicious intent. The virus didn't cause any damage to your system, but instead displayed a message. I'm the Creeper. Catch me if you can. It's actually kind of funny because this playful yet disruptive act foreshadowed the cat and mouse game between hackers and security professionals that continues to this day. The 1970s marked a turning point as hackers began to forge their own identity and beliefs. 
Rumblings of what would become known as the free software movement began to circulate. Essential books that shaped hacker culture were published. The decade even saw the emergence of something called the jargon file, which acted as a dictionary of slang used by hackers and computer programmers. It was things like this that further solidified the community's shared language and values. However, the one thing the culture lacked during this moment in time was a central meeting ground. Sure, ARPANET existed, but again, it was usually restricted to institutions funded by the US government. Local meetups like the Homebrew Computer Club offered some networking opportunities, but their accessibility was limited only to those who could physically attend. The good news was, it wouldn't take too long to fill this cultural void. In 1978, two guys from Chicago developed something called Computer Bulletin Board Systems. Serving as the first virtual meeting place for early hackers, BBS allowed users to dial in with their modems, exchange messages, share software, and participate in discussions, laying the groundwork for the incoming rise of the hacker groups.